You are listening to the Primitive Intelligence Podcast, episode 612. Welcome to Monsterland. This week, we're going to look at reports and stories from a specific area in New England that is just, it's just an absolute hot spot of activity. There's all kinds of crazy things going on here. The book I got these reports from just fell into my lap. I was researching a different story. I got about three quarters of the way through it and realized, wait a second, I've heard this story before. I've heard this before. Where did I hear this before? And it was on another podcast I listened to. And I thought, let me put this aside for right now and spend a little more time researching and getting different information so I'm not doing the same thing. Obviously, there's a lot of podcasts out there. A lot of us are going to cover the same stories because there's only so many stories out there. But I didn't want to do uh, the same thing. Then this, I came across this as I was researching other things and figured this is a great story on its own. So we're going to get right into this. I'm not going to cover every single page, every story of the book. I don't like doing that. This isn't like book reading 101. If the stories are interesting to you, I'll have a link in the show notes. It'll just be an Amazon link. It'll take you to the book. You can get the information for, from, you can get the information for the book there. And then whatever you want, if you want to go look for it somewhere else, you want to buy it there. It's not an affiliate link or anything like that. It's just to give you the information. So definitely check out the show notes. You can get all the information for this book and check it out for yourself. So without any further ado, this episode of the Primitive Intelligence Podcast starts now. So the book I'm covering this week is Monsterland, Encounters with UFOs, Bigfoot, and Orange Orbs by Ronnie LeBlanc. It was published back in 2016, and it's an incredible collection of encounters from the area of Leo Minster, Massachusetts. And the term Monsterland refers to an area of Leo, around Leo Minster, including the Leo Minster State Forest. It starts off with a story that the author, Ronnie, uh, grew up in the area. He, he left for a while and came back. But he talks about this story when he was a kid. He was riding his bike past this Leo Minster State Forest and decides he's going to take his bike through the forest. Even though this section of trails, like always, doesn't matter how bright and sunny it is out, it seems like this little section of forest always is dark. It's almost like a fog hanging over it. But he decides, you know what? I'm going for it. I got the bike. I'll be through quick. He gets into the forest. It's like an uphill trail. So he's pushing his bike through and he stops for some reason. He's just looking at the, the sun and how it's coming through this really thick canopy. And then he notices there's no birds, there's no crickets, there's no noise whatsoever. And then he hears something right next to him, large. It sounds like it's running at him, but he can't see anything. And he just takes off his bike, goes home, never goes back to that section of forest. And later on, he starts thinking about the things, all these stories that he hears. Maybe it was a Bigfoot encounter. He didn't see anything, so he can't verify that, but he just knows whatever it was really weird. Now, one of the key things about that story is this not hearing any birds or crickets or anything else, and everything gets quiet. It's this thing known as the Oz factor, where there's just no, everything goes quiet. It's like this calm, this still doesn't matter what's going on around you. That sound just disappears. And then you're only solely focused on what is happening with this event. So the area of Leo Minster is not known just for Monsterland. It's known for things like the first plastic combs were made there, Tupperware, the, plink, the pink flamingos you see in yards. That's where they got their start. It's also the place where this photo or this video was taken of a time traveler with a phone back in 1938. You may have seen this picture. This is the same area. Now, in this book, he explains the time traveler. There's actually a true story behind this. The photo is real, or the video is real. There is someone who has something to their ear, appears to be talking on it. The woman in that video, who is talking on the space-aged time-traveling phone, is Gertrude Jones. And she was talking on wireless device. She worked for DuPont and she was a part of a team that was testing a new wireless communication device that they were working on. Her grandson 
says he asked her about it after he saw the video and he's, she saw it. She's, oh yeah, I remember that. One of her coworkers was just off screen with another one of the devices that she was talking to. Yeah, she, it does look like she's talking on a phone because she was talking on, it wasn't a phone, it was more like a walkie talkie, but yeah, that's actually what was going on. So it's just really cool that this is where this happened. And in this book, they're like, no, this is the story behind it. This is what actually happened. So that gave me a good, a good feeling for this book that it's not just, here's a story and it, it's you know, absolutely true. It was a time traveler. No. Yep. The event happened, but this is what it was. This is also the place where the video of the time traveler with a phone was taken back in 1938. Now you may have seen this video. There's just people walking by, and at one point you see a woman walk by with a, a device to her head that she appears to be talking into, phone, like a cell phone. And everybody points out that there's no cell phones at this time, that couldn't be, and she must be a time traveler. There's actually a true story to this that they relay in this book, which is pretty cool. The truth of this is that the woman was named Gertrude Jones. And she worked for DuPont. They were working on a prototype wireless communication device. I think it was more like a walkie talkie than a phone. But her grandson had asked her about this because he saw the video and he says, my grandma. So he asks her and he's like, Hey, do you remember this? And she's, Oh yeah, that was, we were working on this prototype device. He, he can't see him. He's off the frame of the video, but one of her coworkers is not too far away with the other device. And they're just testing it. So it's not a time traveler with an iPhone. It's just a woman testing a prototype in 1938. Mundane, but that's the story that they're telling in the book here. So I, th I thought that was pretty cool that they took, they, he could have used this time traveler aspect of the area and really done up the paranormal hotspot aspect of it. But he's, no, that was just a lady testing the early kind of walkie talkie phone kind of thing. So that was cool. But there are a lot of other things in this book that just, like how much stuff can happen in one area. So we're going to start with looking at some of the UFO reports here. And we're going to start with, so we're going to start with it's this Leo Minster, this monster land as a UFO hotspot. So during 1966 through 1968, Massachusetts in general experienced a surge in UFO sightings, particularly in the central area, Phillipston and Royalston, Orange and Tully, where reports often involved UFOs hovering over freshwater ponds. Now, notably the Betty Andreessen, Betty Andreessen, she's a, a famous alien abductee. Her first encounter in Leominster as a child, uh, notably, Betty Andreessen, she's a famous alien abductee. She had her first encounter in Leominster as a child. Her most significant experience occurred in South Ashburnham on January 25th, 1967, where her and her family were allegedly abducted by gray aliens and placed in suspended, an suspended animation aboard a UFO. Investigations led by Raymond F. Fowler involved extensive hypnosis sessions, uh, lie detector tests, and psychiatric evaluations, including concluding that Betty and her daughter were credible witnesses to the encounters, concluding that, that Betty uh, was credible. She was a credible witness to the encounters. The inquiry was met with government surveillance, including FBI monitoring. The inquiry itself was met with uh, government surveillance, including FBI monitoring, unmarked helicopters, and People were watching uh, her home. In later hypnosis sessions in 1980, Betty recalled another UFO encounter as a child in Leominster, where she received a message of future events and her role in helping others. During these sessions, phenomena in later hypnosis se sessions, in later hypnosis, God damn it, in later hypnosis sessions in 1980, Betty recalled another UFO encounter as a child in Leominster, where she received messages of future events and her role in helping others. Now, the way she got these messages was this glowing orb, this little marble-sized glowing ball would fly up to her and attach itself to her temple 
And then she'd hear these messages from a voice in her head. During the sessions, during one of the sessions, this strange orb-like phenomenon and alien apparitions were witnessed by investigators, further compelling the narrative of her experience. The messages were given to her by this marble-sized ball, and like I said, they would attach themselves to a voice in her head. And in the one instance where they saw this orb during one of the hypnosis sessions, they said it just hung out on the drapes. It was just hanging out there. And then it faded away. In Raymond Fowler's book, The Watchers, he discusses the influx of UFO sightings in 1967 around Leo Minster and South Ashburnham in Massachusetts as the Massachusetts director of, as the Massachusetts director, as a Massachusetts director, I'm sorry, as a director of a subcommittee, the Massachusetts subcommittee, as a director for the Massachusetts subcommittee of NICAP, he noted numerous unexplained reports during this period, many involving close range encounters with domed discs and cylindrical objects causing electrical interference and power failures. Reports included a former Coast Guard pilot encountering a domed disc manned by humanoid figures and sightings of oval objects hovering over freshwater ponds. In Leo Minster, a woman witnessed an oval object paralyzing and pinning her husband to the car's frame. Notably, just a week before this incident, Betty Andreessen was abducted from South Ashburnham, from South Ashburnham, adding to the intrigue of the area's UFO activity. Now, let me give a summary of the actual report from this husband and wife who saw this oval object. It's, it was on a clear, cool night, March 1967. This is a pseudonym, Mr. and Mrs. William Roberts from Leo Mister decided to take a late night drive through the countryside. It just snowed. And for some reason, they decided they're going to go out and take this, this late night drive. As they approached the town around 1 a.m. as they're coming back, they encountered a thick fog and noticed a large, bright object above the cemetery. This flattened, egg-shaped object emitted a loud, dynamo-like sound, they said. Now, Mr. Roberts, curious, he turned the car around, stopped, and got out to observe. But when he exited the vehicle and he pointed at the light, the car's lights, the radio, and the engine stopped working. He received an electrical shock that paralyzed him, and his arm was forcibly pushed back against the car roof by an unseen force. Now, despite Mrs. Roberts' pleas, he was unable to move for about 30 to 40 seconds until the object suddenly accelerated upwards and out of sight. The incident left both of them shaken, and the next day, Andover, in Andover, Massachusetts, witnesses reported seeing a similar mysterious object hovering over a country club. In the 1980s, a Leo, now also in Leo Minster in the 1980s, a group of teenage boys witnessed UFOs, witnesses UFO sighting while walking home late at night. They walked along Main Street near Orchard Street, and a bright light suddenly illuminated the area, making it appear as if it were daytime. Making it appear as if it was daytime. One of the boys immediately ran away in fear, while the others remained captivated by the mysterious light. They attempted to flag down the passing vehicles to show someone else the strange occurrence. Eventually, a Leo Mr. police cruiser stopped, and the officer exited his vehicle and witnessed what was going on. <clears throat> the officer exited his vehicle to witness the bright light engulfing the area. Completely perplexed, the officer attempted to radio in, but was at a loss for what to report. Suddenly, the boys found themselves back at one of their houses with no explanation for how they got there. They were standing there with the police officer. He was trying to radio in, and then like that, they're back in their friend's house without knowing how they got there. The boy who had initially run away, they met up with later, he explained that he felt the light was coming to get him, thinking that he may have had previous experiences with similar phenomena. This incident shares similarities with cases of missing time associated with alien abductions, where individuals report few minutes, where individuals report missing time, but discover where individuals only experience a few minutes, but realize after the fact that hours, sometimes more, have actually passed. Similar to well-known cases like Betty and Barney Hill, New Hampshire, or Travis Walton in Arizona. 
the fate of the police officer involved and his response for the event remains unknown. So really crazy, really weird stories. And this was not far from that same cemetery. The book also says, the, the author, Ronnie, said that as he was researching, he found stories from the area on just on the internet, on the web. So he found the author, Ronnie, also came across a bunch of stories, not just from people he was talking to, but online people had posted some of their experiences. So he found this story on about.com and it was titled UFO Encounter in Massachusetts and it was written by Christina D. Now we don't know if this is her real name or if it's a pseudonym, but the story says that in April 1999, she, this Christina and her friends ventured into a wooded area in Leo, Mr. Massachusetts off of a secluded back road after midnight. They walked along a path bordered by trees and water for about half a mile until reaching a clearing near a lake or a pond. As they stood by the water's edge, a bright light appeared above the trees across the water, causing fear and anxiety among the group. Christina felt increasingly tense and frightened as the light... Now, Christina felt increasingly tense and frightened as the light hovered closer and emitted red and blue tie-dye-like lights. Despite urging their best friend to and despite urging her friend to leave immediately, despite urging uh, her friend to leave immediately, her and this group of guys, I guess they had met at the lake, seemed intrigued by the UFO, which caused frustration and desperation for Christina, which caused her uh, a lot of frustration and desperation. She went to escape. Trying to find the... Oh, okay, let me start this all. This is... So the author, Ronnie, he not only talked to people in the area, but he also found some of these stories online. And this one he found on about.com. It was titled UFO Encounters in Massachusetts by Christina D. Now, we don't know if Christina is a pseudonym or her actual name, but this goes and says that in April of 1999, Christina and her friends, uh, Christina and a group of friends ventured into a wooded area in Leominster off of a secluded back road after midnight. They walked along the path, bordered by trees and water for about half a mile until reaching a clearing near a lake or a pond. As they stood by the water's edge, a bright light appeared above the trees across the water, causing both fear and anxiety. Christina felt increasingly tense and frightened as the light hovered closer and emitted red and blue tie-dye-like lights. Despite her urging her friends to leave, the group were intrigued by the UFO, which she just got, caused her to get more and more frustrated and desperate to escape. Trying to find their way back, she encountered difficulty navigating the icy path. <clears throat> she encountered difficulty navigating the, the icy path that was on a hill, feeling terrified and praying for safety. The UFO appeared to follow them closely overhead, causing intense fear and a sense of urgency to escape. Eventually, they made it back to the main path, where the UFO continued to shadow them until they reached their car. Despite her vivid memory of the experience, her best friend has no recollection of the events, and she remains deeply affected by the encounter and vows to never return to those woods. There were several of these stories, and like I said, I'm not going over all of them, but several of these stories seem to happen around this reservoir called the No Town Reservoir. And these, whatever these lights are, whatever these UFOs are, they seem to be attracted to the water there. And it's just, so I'm not sure if this is, it doesn't say, but this may be near the, what's known as the No Town Reservoir. And a lot of these stories seem to happen in this particular area. This is right in the heart of this monster land area. We're going to fast forward. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead in the book a little bit and talk about, it's still UFO, but it's, something a little bit different. This is the 1909 airship. So obviously this happened decades before Christina's account, but in 1909, there was a flap of airship sightings that occurred in the area of Leo Minster. Always seen at night and usually as just a, a light or what looked like a searchlight in the sky. A local inventor, Wallace E. Tillingcast, claimed that the airship was his as he made claims that it could carry three to four 200-pound men, reach speeds of 120 miles an hour, 
and fly from Boston to New York and back without refueling. Now, a few years earlier on the West Coast, similar sightings, before there was a flap of similar sightings there, this strange, dark complexion, dark eyed man, that's how they have it in the book, approached a well known attorney asking for help obtaining patents for a flying machine for an airship. Now, this strange man offered the attorney the right to lay claim to the invention, basically let him play the inventor. He just wanted to get this technology out to the world. So there's a belief that the same thing happened here with this Wallace E. Tillinghast. John Keel theorized something similar may have happened with Tillinghast, and this is basically what he said, that in the fall of 1909, Wallace E. Tillinghast a respected inventor was approached by a group offering him a ride in, an, in a secret aircraft. After being flown around the countryside, they proposed a partnership where Tillinghast would front for them as they perfected their invention. They promised him credit for the invention once it was fully tested and ready for manufacturing. Tillinghast envisioned glory and success. He accepts the proposition and made public statements about his flights and the upcoming unveiling of the invention. However, when reports of mystery uh, airplanes, sur- however, when reports of this mystery airplane surfaced in the press, his mysterious friends urged him to disclose the existence of their invention. Thousands of people in New England witnessed UFO-like phenomenon around Christmas that year, believing they were witnessing Tillingham's invention. However, neither Tillingham nor his supposed partner, Mr. Morgan, ever received the promised aircraft model. They were used by the real inventors, similar to modern UFO contactees, without ever realizing the true nature of the situation. This Mr. Morgan had a property, and on this property, they had found this like 100 foot, like an old barn or shed, and they thought maybe that was where they were hiding this uh, airship. There was never any proof. Tillinghast never was able to produce any proof of the ship, but there were these sightings or these documented sightings of this uh, airship flying around and it was all in this really compact time most of the sightings happened around christmas of that year it was just really weird and then it just stopped and this is all these and this is just a, a small sample of the stories they have probably half the book is just these ufo sightings in this uh, area of new england now that's not all this book covers, though. This also covers Bigfoot. And that's the opening story. Like I said, is when he was a child, he had that weird encounter in the woods. So I'm going to go over a, a little bit of the UFO side. Of the, so I'm going to go over a little bit of the Bigfoot side of this story. So in June 2010, a Leominster couple, they're taking a leisurely hike in Leominster State Forest. And they start from the Granite Street entrance behind Leominster High School. And they're aiming to reach No Town Reservoir. So here's his reservoir again. It's about an hour's walk away to get, it's about an hour's walk away to get there. And despite the sweltering heat, they embark on the trail. About 20 minutes into their hike, they encounter a, a fork in the trail. And they're not sure which way to go. So they, they pick a direction and they start navigating through this really muddy terrain. After a little while, they get this like a little bit of a startle when they hear what sounds like a grunt nearby. They, they stop and they're waiting to see a deer come out. That's exactly what it sounds like. It sounds like a deer snort. So they wait for a minute, nothing comes out and they get, it's a little weird because it's, it was there. They could hear it. They just couldn't see it. And it just never came out, never moved, nothing. It just, it vanished. They're like, okay, they keep going. They go for a little ways before they realize that they're off course. And because it's so hot, they decide they're going to retrace their steps and they're going to head back. Now, as they get back to the fork in the road and in the trail, they noticed something that wasn't there when they came through the first time. Five or six distinct five-toed bare footprints, larger than your average man, about three to five inches deep in the mud and spaced of pretty far apart alongside of these tracks are deer hoof prints and you can tell that the deer isn't sinking as much in the mud as 
these footprints are. So whatever made the, the five toed footprints pretty big, pretty heavy. The weird thing is that the deer tracks at a certain, like the, these two sets of tracks are parallel to each other. The deer tracks just disappear in mud. And it, the husband says it was just like whatever was running alongside of it, caught up to it, just picked it up, just scooped it right up. So immediately they both get alarmed. The husband arms himself with a rock and they start to feel like to be watched. They slowly, but cautiously and quickly at the same time, get back to the car. Now, after the fact, they start reflecting on the local folklore about Monsterland because this no town reservoir is right in the heart of Monsterland. So after the fact that they're thinking about this Monsterland folklore around this area, and they start to think maybe we maybe it was a Bigfoot encounter. There's weird bare foot tracks in there, and they weren't huge. But they then start to remember that while they were there, they had that odds factor. They heard that grunt, but they didn't hear any other wildlife, didn't hear any birds, didn't hear any crickets. So the story gains a little popularity, and it winds up being uh, showcased on Animal Planet's Finding Bigfoot. Consequent stories in the book here talk about how uh, Ronnie, the the author of the book, wound up, without knowing it, met the brother of the, I believe, the husband in that story. And that's that's how he first heard about it. And he met the brother before this happened. As they were talking, I think they were dropping off their kids at school, and they started to talk, and he brought up the, the topic of Bigfoot, and this this guy's brother just laughed about it. You're crazy. And then it was a few weeks later that this happened. And then as soon as it happened, the brother told the, the husband in the, in the story, you got to talk to uh, Ronnie. You got to tell him about what happened. So they actually went back about a week and a half, I think they said, after this happened. And they found the tracks still there. And they got a casting of it. And now I read the ebook version of it, but they do have pictures of the casting. So they, they, there was definitely something there. Now, who put them there, I don't know. But really interesting. And it, like I said, it did. It was on the Finding Bigfoot show. I haven't seen the episode. Maybe I'll see if I can find that. But really a cool story. And it just showcases all these different kinds of things that are happening in this area. So that was back in 2010. In August of 2011, at the Crow Hill area of Leo Minster State Forest, a woman riding her mountain bike at the Route 31 entrance encountered a local fisherman and his daughter. She appeared, now that the bike rider appeared distressed and asked if there were any bears in the area. When the fisherman told her that, eh, yeah, there's, there's bears, she then acquired, inquired, she then about white bears that run on two feet. The woman recounted that while riding her bike on the trail, she felt pursued by an animal. And when she looked around, she saw this thing matching her speed, crashing through the woods on two legs. She described it as a white bear and was visibly shaken, expressing intense fear and vowing to never return. She throws her bike in the car and she takes off. Now the author's trying to figure out why would someone fabricate such an account? Why would you make that? Why would you show up at a bike trailhead and like a, a trailhead with your bike, see a fisherman and his daughter and be like, I was chased by a white bear in two feet. Now the author says that it seems unlikely that someone would just show up at a trailhead, talk to a stranger about seeing a white bear chasing him on two feet. It just sounds like a weird thing to do, which I agree. But he also says that there are other reports of encounters with this white Sasquatch, which is really weird. So again, this is all happening in this no town area. There's no town reservoir area. There's been a lot of unusual encounters that are a lot of times happening during hunting and fishing trips. One incident there, there's a copy repairman. He's at a business fixing something, I guess a copier in a break room. I think it was at an elementary school and as he's working, or maybe he's grabbing something, to, a snack or something like that, there's teachers in there who are talking about these weird instances of what's going on. And I think they're talking about the story that was on TV about the couple who found the tracks. And this copy repairman named Eric is listening and he says, oh, listen, I've got a story for you. 
So he shares a story about a fishing trip where him and a friend are leaving the reservoir. They've been there all day. They've been fishing. They catch this huge cache of fish. They got a big stringer of fish. And they realize it's getting late. The sun's going down. There's actually, actually, the sun's already gone below the horizon. They're losing light. They got to get out. So they're heading back to the car just past dusk or just at dusk. And Eric takes, they got a lot of fish. So he takes the stringer fish. He picks up a branch off the ground, a fallen branch. He puts the fish on the branch and he throws it over his shoulder. And they're just booking it back out to the car. And all of a sudden, it's like it happens instantly. Something large and powerful grabs the fish, grabs the branch, just yanks it right out of his hand. They can't see it. It's dark in these woods. They've got barely enough light to see through the trees. The thing just comes out, grabs this branch, grabs his hands in the darkness. They just sprint back to their car. They're like, we're out. They don't even try to, to fight it. They just, they're gone. Now, they're convinced it wasn't a bear. And Eric says that whatever took it, it didn't like swipe at it. It grabbed it with hands. Like it forcibly grabbed this branch and just pulled it out of his hands and only went for the fish. So at the time, they're trying to rationalize it and they're thinking, okay, it had to just be a bear. And it was just going for the, <laughs> had to be a bear. But the more stories he hears, the more he thinks about it and more he's like, it grabbed the branch. It didn't, it looked like hands and pulled it out of his, and he's not a small guy, he says. So this thing just yanked it right out of, so he now believes that they encountered Sasquatch. Every, any other explanation just really doesn't seem to fit anymore, but he's never returning. He's never going fishing there. A lot of people have these encounters. Just, they're done. They're just not going back. That story reminds me of one I covered a few episodes ago where the guy, I forget where it was, he had just moved to the area. And he had met with some people trying to make friends, and they asked him if he fished. And they all left right before sunset, but he decided to stay to watch the sunset. And then as he's standing there, something throws a rock at his truck. And he's mad because he thinks there's someone in there throwing rocks at his truck, so he goes to confront them. And then he sees this thing stand up, and he's, what the crap is that? He goes back to his truck. Gets another rock thrown at him. And then when he gets in the truck, the thing runs up and starts shaking the bed of his truck. And then he, he notices as he drives away that the, it's holding something in his hands. And he realizes when he gets home, what it did is it stole his fish. And Bigfoot just likes, he likes fish and he will steal them if he has to. So that's weird. That's, that's the second story like that I've seen. A lot of the Bigfoot encounters are in the book are encounters where nothing's really seen. Is just people get this weird feeling. So I didn't cover a lot of those, but a lot of it, they tie back to that story where he goes back and casts those footprints. So very interesting. I might want to look more into that because that seems like a pretty interesting story. And if there's an episode on it somewhere, I might want to watch it. But what about these orange orbs it talks about in the title? The author, Ronnie, he recounts a vivid sighting of two basketball-sized orange orbs flying silently over, their, over his car near Leominster in December of 2011. The orbs, resembling glowing suns, like little tiny glowing suns, moved deliberately and seemed alive, he says, unlike any known lanterns or conventional objects. Despite the excitement, there was a sense of mystery and intelligence behind the orbs, and there, there's too much, he's driving. There's too much traffic. He can't really stop. He gets a chance at a red light to stop for a second and look and decides he should have gotten the other lane so he could pull over and, and watch them, but he can't. So he goes home. He, he goes on social media, sees a, a friend of his who's also in this kind of stuff is, is online, sends, sends him a message, tells him what he sees. And it turns out that his friend worked in the, the mall that he was driving by, this place where he was going to pull over, but didn't. He was sitting there. He watched it too. He saw the exact same thing. So as they're talking about, they suspect that this, there's this deeper link between UFOs and paranormal phenomena like Bigfoot and all these other things that are going on. And Ronnie delves into scientific theories, dismissing conventional explanations like ball lightning and suggesting the orb's origin 
may be tied more to elusive natural phenomenon or unknown forces. The synchronicity of their shared sighting leads them to explore deeper into the realm of the unexplained. And he talks a little bit about synchronicities and he goes into the whole, the whole point of the, like the Chinese lanterns. Now I've seen plenty of Chinese lanterns when I lived in Florida, people set those things off all the time. If they're close enough, you can clearly tell that they're Chinese lanterns. If they're way up in the sky, you might at first think, oh, that's weird looking. But then you immediately can tell it's a Chinese lantern. I've seen them just like randomly. Just all of a sudden you see this weird light flying and it does at first take you by surprise. But as soon as you, you take 30 seconds, not even 12 seconds to look at it, you can see that it's a Chinese lantern. So what are these things? The ball lightning explanation. Interesting ball lightning. We don't really know what causes ball lightning or how it acts or what it is, to be honest, but it usually occurs during electrical storms. And this event happened on a clear night. Could it be? It's possible. But it, how often do you see ball lightning? It's just weird. These, orb, these orbs are weird. I've told the story of the, the ghost light that I saw in the Catskills that clearly wasn't ball lightning. It wasn't uh, a firefly. It wasn't a Chinese lantern. I don't know. I can't explain what it was. It seemed to react to me. Cause I thought it was another camper that was in the campsite with me. They had a really dim headlamp and I thought they were about to walk off a cliff because they were really close to the edge of a cliff. And I called out to him. I was like, Hey dude, stop. And it stopped. And then they didn't reply to me. And I thought maybe they didn't, they couldn't see where I was. So I popped my head out of my hammock and turned on my headlamp and I could see where this really dim light was. But when I turned my headlamp on and I could see the area like in front of underneath and behind the light and there was nobody standing there. It was just this light hovering there. It was really bizarre. So I get when you see these things and people say, oh, it was just this. And I spent a good, the rest of the night trying to figure out what could have caused that. Was it a, a road on the other side of the valley? No, I'd hiked over there. There's no roads. Could it be? I think in my mind at the time, I just was like, oh, it was an owl and there was light reflecting off of it. And I also, it, and during that experience, I experienced that odds factor. It was really, really bizarre. So yeah, I understand. <clears throat> so I can understand his point of view where he's, look, I've thought of all these other things and it's not it. In John Fuller's book, Instant at Exeter, he discusses UFO sightings in New Hampshire and Massachusetts, highlighting encounters with distinctive orange balls of light. One uh, Mrs. Edward Liscombe vividly describes seeing a large solitary orange orb stating, the one I saw last night was a big orange ball, nothing but orange. Also in Fuller's research, he uncovered another compelling account from Massachusetts where a teenage girl reported witnessing a U.S. Air Force plane attempting to chase one of these orbs. The incident occurred in New Hampshire just before dusk around 7 p.m. with multiple witnesses present. Despite the visibility afforded by the fading daylight, the girl described a scene where the jet was unable to close in on the orange red ball of light, resembling a fiery red ball. As they both streaked across the sky, the girl noted, and the plane couldn't get anywhere near it. So what's going on in Leominster, this hot spot area, in and around that area? Now, some of the stories were from a little bit further out, and he does touch on stories that the author does touch on stories from other areas in the country that tie into these stories, but I didn't really go into those. And there's a lot more. <laughs> there's so much more in this book. I definitely suggest you check it out. Very good read. I, when I got to the orange orbs part, I was running out of time. I just found this book yesterday. So there's still some more for me to read, but this is really cool. And I'm not that far from that area. So I might need to take a trip up there and see if I can maybe do a camp in Leo Minster State Forest. That'd be cool. So what do you guys think? Have you, are you from this area? Have you encountered anything? Have you heard these stories? Is there anywhere near you that is a, a hotspot area? What some, sometimes is known as a window area. Have you encountered any of these weird orbs or colored orbs, Bigfoot, unexplained lights in the sky? 
really would be curious to know, you can contact me at podcast at primitiveintelligence.com. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, you can just leave a comment. I want to thank uh, those of you who reach out about the Mandela effects. I got a few cool ones on that. I love hearing these emails and these stories that you guys got. So definitely let me know and let me know what you think of the podcast as a whole. That's going to do it for me for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you want to hear more about the Leo Minster area, let me know. I will see if I can find more stories. There's definitely more in that book. But for now, I'm going to get this edited and get it out to you. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Enjoy the rest of your week. See ya.